Have you ever met anybody that you just can't seem to agree with? You can't seem to find any common ground with this person when you're discussing things with them. Or conversely, um, have you ever had a moment where somebody that you thought that you saw very eye to eye with says something that throws you for a loop? You, you thought you knew this person, but now they've said something that has kind of changed your view of that person. You thought you had a lock on this person, or at least enough of a lock to sort of get a bit comfortable and at ease with this person, but then you discover something that doesn't mix with all of that. Um, now, <clears throat> one of those two scenarios can lead you to sort of question um, the value of other people's opinions. Uh, question the value of even wanting to solicit other people's opinions. Because you're going to think there's nobody out there that really knows what they're talking about because the people that I thought I, I was impressed by have gone off script and there are other people out there that I'm so unimpressed by that they have to, I have to in some way I have to say they're just consummately wrong um, now that is a nasty log jam um, in terms of navigating I think one's relationships with others and in terms of attempting to apprehend the truth through discussion <clears throat> if you think that such and such a person is just plain wrong and yet you persist in arguing with this person and we see this all the time I'm as guilty of this as anybody else you argue with people that you simply know that you're not going to change this person's point of view and yet you seek out this person in order to test your mettle against them or perhaps to which I do all the time testing my mettle against other people is a way in which I exploit and use people on YouTube I'm afraid I do that I've, you know, it, it, I don't know if it's a vice but it's something that I do I, you know, as I always compare it to I walk into a bar and I pick a fight with the biggest guy in the room. Walk over and whack, knock his pint over and say, what are you going to do about what I just did? Um, <clears throat> now that can be useful, but it, it's antagonistic, right? You're just, you're, you're pissing in somebody's cornflakes, essentially, and saying, do something about it if you think you're so tough, if you think you're so smart, let's see what you're going to do. That can be of use in some circumstances, but as a general rule, it I found that it screws up your relationships with people that might be useful to you, might even be pleasant. Um, going head-on with people that you disagree with will only sort of get you so far, um, and it can lead to chronically antagonistic relationships. Now, again, there is a place for that, I suppose, but... When there are pitfalls to it. The other thing is when people that you admire sort of fall in your estimation of them. You sort of go, wow, what a letdown this is. I, I thought this person was great. Now I discover that maybe they're not so great. Now I know that maybe they discover something that, or that you discover something about them that you can't mesh with your overall picture of them or the picture that you had of them before they said or did this one thing. And you can't understand why this intelligent person would feel this way, would think this way, would act this way. This person that you've kind of come to admire. <clears throat> Two sort of difficulties when dealing with, I guess you'd call it dialectical or ongoing discussions. As you see that my channel, the, ph the philosophy that I, or the way that I tend to approach the entire thing is almost open-ended. I almost assume that, although this, is, this isn't really correct, but it, in a sense I assume that I'm never really going to find the truth, or at least in a way that I can 
then discuss the absolute truth with other people. But I like to constantly examine every idea out there. <clears throat> now, what do you do about this? What do you do about people that are wrong, or people that you thought were right and then said something that just doesn't compute with you? How do you deal with that? Well, you, do you avoid people that you clash with, and do you cut people out of your life for the slightest slip-up that they make? Or do you have to overlook their warts on a good person? You have to sort of say, well, okay, I don't agree with this person on this, and normally I wouldn't cut anybody any slack but because, uh, on this one issue, but because of this person, is the overall picture is pretty good, I'm willing to accept that, even though that actual part of that person I still reject. Um, a little bit of, I don't know, emotional sleight of hand taking place there, and not a little bit of double think, I think. Um, <clears throat> these are serious problems to anyone who discusses philosophy. Uh, antagonistic or overly or misleadingly um, pleasant relationships or affirming relationships. Um, you may actually start to engage in in-group thinking, even though you didn't mean to in the beginning. Um, that's one of the pratfalls of spending too much time with people that you agree with. <coughs> too much time with people that you disagree with, I guess, just turns you into a fundamentally combative person. Um, what you do has effects on you, right? What you do and what you experience colors you, or that which is your personality, your character. Disagreements, how do you deal with them, is the question inherent in all of this. Well, Sapta Bhangivad, um, it's the sevenfold theory of multiple viewpoints and multiple affirmations. Even when someone says something wrong, wrong, in some ways it can be right. <clears throat> now this isn't saying that black is white, by the way. This isn't just simple, deliberately inculcated psychosis like Orwell's actual double think is. What you're doing is you're giving every statement kind of the benefit of the doubt. Okay. Now, you need a little bit of courage for this, and I'll explain later. But the essentially Saptabhangi means the um Saptabhangi Vad means the seven predicates. And it basically means the sevenfold theory of maybe. I like to call it the theory of maybe because it's easy and it flows off the tongue and it's kind of catchy too. But it, maybe it doesn't really doesn't really um, capture it, if you ask me. And there may not be any any um, English equivalent. <coughs> but you can also use the terms arguably, or perhaps the closest in my understanding to actual syadvada or saptabhangivad is in some ways. Now you take any proposition. For example, let's take the proposition du jour. Um, Donald Trump is a good president of the United States. Now, there's an interesting one, and we'll, you know, it's, it's a good one because it's controversial, and you know, people are split on this guy and what he represents. And polarization is a big issue in Western society and perhaps the world these days. <clears throat> so you take this proposition, Donald Trump is a good president. And you put it through these seven um, seven predicates. So the sevenfold theory of maybe, the actual predicates are Siadasti, one, in some ways it is, or in this case in some ways he is. 
um, in some ways, Donald Trump is a good president. Okay, in what ways would you argue that Donald Trump is a good president? Well, he hasn't embroiled the United States in any wars yet. And we think that that's the mark, I guess, of a good president. Okay. Um, he, um, you know, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm not really deliberately stumbling here, but, you know, you, you can actually make a case that Donald Trump is a good president. If you're, if you're a, okay, let's assume then, here, here's, here's a good case. Let's assume that the United States is being swamped by immigrants, okay? Way more than the United States can handle. Well, then Donald Trump is a good president. If there's a problem on the Mexican border, then Donald Trump is a good president because at least he's brought attention to it there. Now, that's an if, okay? And we can argue whether or not the Mexican border is a problem. The U.S.-Mexican border is a problem, or whose fault it is, or whatever. But if that is a major crisis facing the United States, then Donald Trump, just in drawing the attention to it that it requires, is a good president. Okay. Now, it doesn't stop there. Okay? It doesn't stop there. We've just established that in some ways, and from some perspectives, Donald Trump is a good president. <clears throat> then we go on. Siad Nasti. In some ways, it is not. In some ways, he is not. Okay? Um, how is Donald Trump not a good president? Well, either he or what he represents or his rise has polarized the United States. Um, or if we say that, if we accept the premise that his rise has polarized the United States, or his rise has either facilitated or been the result of a spike in racism and hate crimes. So in some ways, Donald Trump is not a good president, but that doesn't negate the fact that in some ways he is. Okay, so now we've got two. So in some ways, Donald Trump is a good president, and in some ways, he isn't a good president. Siad Asti Nasti. It's a combination of the first two. In some ways, Donald Trump is a, is a good president, and in some ways, he isn't a good president. So all you have to do is include the perspectives that say that he is a good president with the ones that say he isn't a good president. Okay? So you're, it, it's kind of something that's building here. Like, each premise builds on the other, but each one of these premises can also stand on its own. And what you're doing is you're sort of examining this one proposition in an affirming way. You're trying to agree with it. You're making an effort to agree with it, um, with the statement, and you're also making an effort to disagree with it. But you're trying to reconcile your agreement with your disagreement. The fourth premise, or the fourth predicate, Siad Asti Avaktaiva. <laughs> I don't know if I'm pronouncing Sanskrit correctly. I've never taken a course in it. Um, in some ways, it is, and it is indescribable. Okay, in some ways, Donald Trump is a good president, but you can't really say why. All right, where would, how would you sort of tackle that one? Some people just have a good vibe from him. Some people just say, look, here's a guy who's got energy, who's got drive, who really wants to make his mark on the United States. I, he hasn't really done anything yet. It's early days in his presidency. But he certainly seems to want to do something. He doesn't seem to be the guy who's going to mark time when he's in the White House and just, you know, the sort of thing that they blamed Clinton for. Um, Bill Clinton in his second term. He was Bubba. He was just sitting there doing nothing. Um, just letting the United States do what the United States does. Whereas Trump is the opposite. He's a hands-on president. Isn't that a good thing? 
But how do you describe something like that? It just he just comes across that way. I don't know why I think that way about him, if assuming that I do, but he looks like a guy to get things done. Now, Syad Nasti Avaktavya. That's the fifth one. In some ways, it is not in this indescribable. In some ways, Donald Trump is not a good president, and I can't really put my finger on it. I don't know where he's going with this, and people with this kind of drive often have agendas. Um, he hasn't really been that racist in his pronouncements, but you get the vibe that maybe he is, you know? But I can't really put my finger on it. And I don't like that feeling. A president shouldn't give people that vibe, you know, assuming that there are things that a president should and shouldn't do. We would assume that a leadership is supposed to, a leader, a mark of leadership is to inspire confidence in your, the people you're leading. And if he's not inspiring confidence, then he's failing as a leader, right? And if people really have this bad feeling about him, um, he's blaming everybody else for that bad feeling right now. But in a sense, he's supposed to have the qualities as a leader that people don't feel that way about him. So in some ways, he's a bad president, but I can't really say why. He kind of wigs me out a bit. <coughs> Siad Asti Nasti Avaktavya. In some ways, it is. It is not. And it is indescribable. In some ways, Trump is a good president and it's indescribable. In some ways, Trump is a bad president and it is, it is indescribable. He has a certain je ne sais quoi about him that is sometimes good and sometimes not so good, or sometimes not the way we want a president to be. But it's all sort of indescribable. It's sort of a vibe that we get, an overall picture that we get from this guy. Um, and we can't quite put our finger on it. And he fascinates us, but he also makes us nervous. He causes disquiet, even though he fascinates us and rivets our gaze on what he does. <clears throat> Oftentimes, people are obsessed by things that they overtly loathe, right? And they don't really know why they're obsessed with it. A lot of people sort of are really into things like the Third Reich or whatever, who would, they would, they don't, they've never hurt anybody. They, they're against war and they have nothing against Jews and, you know, this sort of thing. But they're really fascinated by the phenomenon of the Nazis. And they don't know why. Okay. In some ways, you know, they they're disturbed by it. In some ways, they're not disturbed by it, and they don't really know why, uh, or they can't put their fing fingers on it. And then finally, Siad Avaktavya. In some ways, it is indescribable. In some ways, you just can't put your finger on it one way or the other. You can't see how these things... You can't really say what you think of this. Now that, to me, is a really profound feeling. I remember the first time... I, well, here, let's get go back to Donald Trump. Donald Trump is a good president. Well, in some ways, that's indescribable, period. You can't... I can't really talk about whether or not he's a good president at all. Why? Well, okay, from my perspective, I'm a Canadian, so in that perspective, it's none of my business. Um, so it's just not an issue to me. Or if I were to ask um, an Innu living in northern Canada, uh, you know, the people that used to live in igloos, I ask them, what do you think of Donald Trump? Who's he? Don't know who he is, haven't got a clue, don't care. You know, I'm not saying that the people up there haven't heard of Donald Trump, but he wouldn't really impinge on that person's life to an enormous amount. In fact, he wouldn't impinge on their life probably at all. Uh, so he might just sort of go, Donald Trump, nothing to do with me. Never even heard of the guy. Not interested. You know, I'm more interested in, I don't know, thinking about what I'm going to have for supper or 
how I'm, how I'm going to pay my electricity bill this year or um, you know stuff like this other concerns um, or in another way that the prominent premise that Donald Trump is a good president is indescribable is well he's just started his presidency how can you say anything about him one way or the other see that it's completely indescribable um, it leaves things open-ended because sometimes things are open-ended right it's not so much that we don't know it's we can't really say yet we don't have enough information or we don't we don't believe that we have enough information to say anything either way but I was going to say I the first time I saw a movie that moved me profoundly when I first saw it visually and the stories and the ideas that were raised about consciousness and existence and all this kind of thing. It's the movie Blade Runner with Harrison Ford, the original one. I guess they're going to remake it. Or maybe they have. I don't really pay attention. The first time I watched that movie, at the end of it I went, what on earth was that? I didn't know how I felt about the movie. It had affected me, and rather profoundly, considering that it's just a movie. Um, you know, it's just a series of images flashed on the screen that are definitely not real. But it had an effect on me. But I didn't know what the effect was. I, went, I was kind of dumbfounded by it. Only later on, after I repeatedly watched it, it's one of those movies that I can watch. Well, actually, I can kind of do this. I have the kind of mind where I can watch the, mo uh, the same movie over and over again and listen to the same piece of music over and over and over again, and it doesn't jade my mind. I don't know why this is, but that's just how I am. Only after I'd watched it a few other times did I decide I really, really liked this movie. I liked its darkness. I liked its mixture of pessimism with optimism, all this kind of thing. But at first I didn't know what I thought of it. I couldn't evaluate it, even though it, it had affected me. There's your sevenfold theory, Saptabhangivad, um, that sort of gives expression to the idea of Syadvada, um, which is the theory of predicates, where you examine every last proposition that anyone could actually be convinced by and wonder why they are convinced by it. And you want to understand why this person who you seem to disagree with so profoundly has said something so absurd or believes something so absurd. In their universe, what, what they think is correct is right. Now, in, in some ways it is right, and in some ways it isn't right. In some ways you, you can agree with it, in some ways you can't agree with it. Now, <clears throat> it's a difficult thing to sort of put into words, uh, Syadvada, because it's not a belief. People will often say, well, that's just a point of view, that, and it, it, it assumes that there is no one correct point of view, and etc. Well, it kind of does and it kind of doesn't. You have to apply you know, Syadvada to itself. You have to apply Anakantavada to itself. You have to apply all these things to each other and to themselves. Um, <clears throat> because it's not so much a belief, it's a litmus test, it's a tool, it's a means of approaching ideas that you find difficult to digest at first glance. And it's also a way of inoculating yourself against falling or going from being convinced by something to believing in it. There is a difference between being convinced of something and believing it. When you're convinced of something, you say, considering the evidence, this strikes me as a valid statement to make. When you believe in it, you stop asking yourself why you th you're, you're convinced by it. You just, bang, I take that for granted now. Um, because that can, make all, that can result in all kinds of problems down the line. So, if you agree with somebody most of the time and they say something that considers that you consider completely incongruous or in, incongruent with how they normally approach things or how, they, how you normally get along with them, this can sort of prevent you from judging this person. Oh, my son has just woken up, so I better get away from the camera. Um, 
Also, if somebody profoundly disagrees with you, and you will never agree with that person, this will prevent you from getting too pissed off by the whole thing, by this idiot who just doesn't get it. And it'll also prevent you from clashing. It'll also prevent you from... Or it can help you. Uh, it can help you avoid pointless clashes and just nastiness, things like that. If that's what you want to avoid. If you want to avoid nastiness. Um, but it's something like a lot of the stoic techniques where they tell you you have to work at this you have to continually bring this tool into your thinking into your day to day living um, you know the the stoic idea of there's that which is in your control and that which you, it isn't in your control and you have to constantly remind yourself is there or ask yourself is this in my control or isn't it in my control you have to do this all the time and you have to work at it until it starts to come sort of as a habit Anikantavada, um, vada and Saptavangivad actually work that way they're not just things that you can accept and then start to defend that position or defend that idea of employing this because that's when it that's it's become a belief right it's just a way of managing your perceptions of reality um, you don't have to believe in any of this you don't have to believe in a hammer if your aim is to bang a nail into a piece of wood you don't have to believe in Anikandavada or Syadvada or Saptamangivada or anything like that if your aim is simply to see things from as many different points of view as possible, to avoid pointless log jams and going toe to toe with people all the time and having toxic arguments, or even you want to avoid in group thinking, this will help you. Um, and it also, if you ask me, neatly transcends the entire idea of solipsism. I get accused of, I shouldn't say accused, but a lot of people perceive what I talk about is I'm sort of arguing for a position of solipsism and I'm not. But let's say I've you know, how how could you take Saptavangivad, the sevenfold uh, theory of or the sevenfold predicates the seven predicates I guess um, how could you say that it, I am arguing solipsism? That's an interesting way. In some ways I am, in some ways I'm not. In some ways I am and I'm not. And in some ways I am and it's indescribable and in some ways I'm not and it's, you know, it just go on like that. Um, it's just a way of, it's just a means of apprehending reality in a certain way. I find it a seamless way or a, a less hassling way, not hassle free but you're cutting down on your hassles when you're trying to explore other points of view and you have a reason for exploring other points of view <clears throat> and like any other tool these things can be abused you know you can you know you can, you can become a classic sophist doing stuff like this a classic negative stereotype of the sophist who just demolishes everybody else's point of view and laughs at them you can be maliciously into these things if you want or you can use them maliciously any tool can also be used as a weapon um, But that, in my opinion, kind of sums it up. And what I am attempting to do, for my own purposes, is I have a problem with the, con with the conclusions that a lot of people come to when they use absolutes. They come to conclusions that I can't necessarily accept. And this is where these three, or however many, there's a number of tools to help yourself think from different points of view and understand different points of view. These will help you escape that. Or these will help you at least avoid that or navigate that minefield of what absolute thinking, of what I'm right and you're wrong, can do. Um, 
Because ultimately, do I really want to prove that the other guy is wrong, or do I want to see the truth, or do I want to perceive things the way they really are? Who knows, right? 